you could be with us today as we're kicking off this new series called Together. Over the next few weeks, we want to talk about this idea of pursuing purpose in Christian community, pursuing all that God has for us with a community of believers. And so let me start by asking you this question. I want to talk to you about this idea of togetherness. What's one of your, your favorite memories, favorite seasons of life where you really felt like you had togetherness, like you were connected, you were part of something bigger than yourself, part of something special. Think about that. What was a special time in your life? Maybe it was when you were a kid growing up with your family. My mom texted me a picture of me and my brothers the other day. We got a picture for you. This is me. I'm on the right. Now, I'm one of four boys. My oldest brother's not in this picture. He was eight years older than us. But this is me. That's my, my baby brother, John, who's a pastor in Atlanta. And my brother, Josh, who's an ch army chaplain over in Italy. And, and uh, man, when I think about the first memories of togetherness, I think about my brothers. Like, we did everything together. We lived out on the street playing football, basketball, like all day long, especially during the summertime. We slept in bunk beds together. We played video games together. Come on, we mastered Nintendo Super Mario Brothers. I could beat that game in my sleep. Me and my brothers, I have memories of playing games with them. We would go out in the woods. We had a patch of woods by our house, and we would play war. Come on, this is the kind of stuff boys do. We would we'd dress them in camo, we'd smear, like, smear like paint in our face, and like go out and, and play war. It was awesome. And I often miss those times with my brothers growing up. What was a season of, of feeling connected, a season of togetherness for you? Maybe it was in high school or, or in college. You had a special friend group that you belonged to. When I was in college, there was one year that I actually dormed in a room with six buddies, six guys in a dorm room. Talk about togetherness. I think I got like five hours of sleep the whole semester. Can you just smell that situation? Six guys, like I can smell that memory. <laughs> six guys living in a dorm room together. But it was like a really awesome season of just being with my, my buddies. Maybe you belong to on a, a sports team or a club. Come on, there's nothing like being a part of a team, right? To, to make you feel connected, to make you feel this, this idea of togetherness. Uh, maybe uh, in, in your career, there's been a season when you really felt like you were on a great team, or there was a great office culture at work, and there was this great sense of kind of belonging to something special. I think there's one thing that we all have in common, no matter where you are, whatever walk of life you're in, wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, I think we all have this need. We crave connection and meaningful friendships and, and relationships. Like we have this desire that to be known and loved. I think that's something that we all, we're all wired with this need to be known and loved. And in some ways, we're more connected technologically than any generation of human beings who've ever lived before us, right? We have social media. Uh, you can have a thousand friends on Facebook. You can have tons of followers on Instagram. You can Snapchat people. Um, we have phones. We're walking around. We can text. We can call. We can Zoom. We can FaceTime. I FaceTime my brother in Italy sometimes, and it's cool, right? It's like he's in the room next to me. We have all this technology. In some ways, we, we seem so connected, yet in other ways, we're probably the most disconnected generation of people to ever live on the planet. In so many ways, we're, we're, we're disconnected. I mean, we're, we're so busy as modern day people that it's hard to even make time for friendships. And then we're the most mobile human beings to ever live. I mean, we can get on airplanes and fly anywhere we want. And because of that, we can relocate easily. And with remote working, it's so easy for people to pick up and move. And many of you relocated here to the New York City area from all over the world and other cities in, in the U.S. But sometimes that makes it challenging to have like long-term meaningful relationships. And many of us, we live away from family. I know that's true for me and Amy. Her family's in Western New York and uh, my family's down South in the New Orleans area. And sometimes that adds to a sense of disconnectedness and don't have that family support. And then there are seasons of life where people just move in and out of our lives. Sometimes we lose a loved one. Sometimes friendships change or people move away. And sometimes it feels like it's hard to start over again and open our hearts to, to new relationships. Come on, the, the reality is that we live in an area with millions of people all around us, yet there are so Many people who feel lonely, who feel isolated. But what do we see in Scripture? We see that God wired us with a need for relationships. In fact, right at the, right at the creation, when God created Adam, what did he say? He said, it is not good for man to be alone. Now, all the married ladies in the house said, yeah, I already knew that was true. It's not good for man to be alone. I leave him home, and the kids tear up the house, and nobody takes out the garbage. It's not good for man to be alone. <laughs> Come on, married ladies. But that's not what the scripture was talking about, okay? It wasn't talking about Adam not taking out the garbage and not keeping up with the house. 
It's talking about this idea that we, we need relationships. We're wired for connection. We're wired to be in meaningful relationships. And then the other thing that we see in Scripture is that the entity that God is working through in this world to do his work, to bring about the salvation of humanity, is the church, the church of Jesus Christ, a group of people, a community of believers, a spiritual family. This is what we see. This is what we see. God, God wants us to be in relationship. God, God has given us this, this idea of, of togetherness. And so here's the idea I want to put out there for this series. In a culture of disconnectedness, God is calling us to embrace togetherness. God is calling us to embrace togetherness. See, there's something we can only become together that we cannot become on our own. You got to get that. There's something that, that, that I can only become with you. There's something that you can only become with me that we can never be on our own. And God actually designed it that way in a world of isolation and individualism and in disconnectedness. God is calling us to togetherness. So today, what I want to talk to you about is finding purpose in the context of community. Oftentimes we think about purpose, but we don't always connect that idea to community. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Now, part of the way that we find purpose and meaning in our lives is by telling our stories. When you meet someone, what do you naturally begin to talk about? Like, t tell me your story. Like, tell me a little bit about yourself. We, we tell stories. We tell our story. That's, that's part of how we find meaning in our lives. How many of you have like a family origin story that your, that your family tells that maybe you heard your parents tell when you were a kid. Maybe it's the story of how your parents met, and that's a story in your house that's well known, or, or I think this is one that resonates with a lot of people, especially here in New York. Maybe it's the story of how your family came to the U.S., how they immigrated here and kind of began a new life here. I know that's, that's very familiar with so many people, or if that doesn't resonate with you, at least we tell the story of where and how we grew up. These are the things we naturally talk about when we meet someone. It's, it's our origin story. It's how we get to know someone. See, my, we have some examples in our family. So from my, my wife's um, and her side of the family, her dad's side, especially her, her uh, grandparents came over from Ukraine after World War II. And that's a story that Amy grew up hearing, right? That's a story we tell our kids. And so Amy grew up with some of these cool Ukrainian traditions and, and uh, we still do some to this day, like dying Easter eggs at, at uh, Easter time. And that was really special, kind of a story that gave, gave meaning for her. My family... Uh, my great great grandfather came over from Germany, and so we've been in the states for too many generations, like since the turn of the century, to really know much about the story. But we're church people. Uh, my dad's a pastor. I'm a pastor. My brothers are pastors, and so I think the story that we tend to tell is the story of my grandmother being invited to church during the Great Depression as a little girl, and coming to, to faith and a relationship with Jesus that totally changed the whole trajectory of our family. It's a framing story. It's an origin story. Do you have one? Does this resonate? These are the stories that, that we tell. And I think they, they help us give meaning to our lives. And I think there are some clues there to your purpose. Now, let me put this idea out there. When we read the scriptures, when we open the scriptures, we're invited into a story. We're invited into a story, the story of God's interaction with humanity to bring about salvation. Maybe you've never thought about it that way, that the Bible isn't so much an instruction manual as it is the story of, of salvation history. I know sometimes we think about it that way. I turn to the, to the Bible when I need advice for something or how to live. And we used to have this cheesy acronym back in the day growing up in church. It was B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Anybody ever heard of that one before? If you didn't, I'm glad you didn't. We want to spare you from that era of cheesy Christianity, okay? We had t-shirts and weird stuff like that, and we wondered why people thought we were odd. <laughs> but sometimes we kind of think about the, the Bible that way, and, and obviously there is practical wisdom for our lives. But, but let me kind of show it to you in a different way today. The Bible isn't so much a, an instruction manual as it is the story of God's interaction with humanity to bring about the, the redemption and the salvation of humanity. And the story unfolds in four major parts— four major arcs. I'll kind of uh, uh, acts. Let me sum summarize them for you today, okay? The, the, the first act is creation. We open the scriptures and we read how God is the creator. God created the heavens and the earth and the moon and the stars and the, and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. And the pinnacle of his creation is humanity. God created human beings. And, and the scripture says of all that God created, he made humanity in his image, which means he placed something of himself on the inside of, of humanity. Humanity was always meant 
to represent him in this world, to have co-dominion with God, to rule over creation. But we don't get too far into the story till we get to the, the next act, the next part, and that is the fall, because we know that something went terribly wrong. Human beings rebelled against God rebelled against his rule. And with that came the curse of sin. And with the curse of sin came the curse of death. And not too much further along in the story, we see the world is in chaos and people are hurting each other and killing each other and stealing from each other and raping each other. Terrible things are happening. And, and there's this sense that, that the world is not as it should. It's in a fallen condition. Come on, anybody around here ever put on the news and there's a sense like the world is not as it should be. If you've ever felt that before, that's downright spiritual because the world is not in the condition that God originally intended it to be. But here's the good news. God was not willing to leave it in that condition. Come on, he's a God of redemption. And that brings us to the next part of the story. We like that word redemption around here, by the way. That's the next part of the story. God begins to work out salvation, the redeeming of humanity. And so he creates a people for himself. He goes to this man, Abraham, and he says, I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna make you into a great nation and you're the Descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And of course, he became the father of the, the Jewish people, a people who their whole purpose was to represent God in this world, to be an example of how to live, to, to embody his redemptive purposes. But how many of you know that the Israelites were human beings like you and me, and they had a hard time holding up their end of the bargain? And thank God in his grace, he said, I'm going to go ahead and just do the job myself. And he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to take on flesh and blood, come on, to walk in our shoes, to show us how to live, to teach us how to live. And then he went to the cross and he showed a self-sacrificial love and he, and he prayed for our sins on the cross. And then he was resurrected to conquer death and give us new life. Come on, that's the redemption part. And then we look forward as we get to the end of the story, as we get to the end of the Bible, and we look forward to the final part, and that is restoration, the day when Jesus will return and finish what he started, finish what he set into motion, the day when his kingdom will fully come. There'll be a new heavens and a new earth, and there's going to be a judgment. There's not going to be any more evil in this world. There's not going to be any more injustice. This, this, the scripture says there's not going to be any more weeping or sorrow or, or death. And Jesus says that, behold, I make all things new. Come on, don't we long for that day? on the days when we hear terrible things in the news, on a day when we read about school shootings or something awful like that, don't we long for the day when Jesus will return and put all of the wrongs to right? That, that is the story. I want you to see it. When you open the scriptures, you are invited into a story. And so you have to learn to situate your Christian experience within the story. You have to learn to situate your faith within the story because so often we, we don't do that. There's a context, there's an overarching story. You gotta find yourself in the story. All right, let me put it to you this way. Any of you, uh, we have any Lord of the Rings fans in the house? Any Lord of the Rings fans? In the uh, second book, which is also a movie uh, by J.R. Tolkien, The Two Towers, Sam and Frodo, they're about to go off on this like really epic journey when Sam says to to Frodo, I wonder what sort of tale we've fallen into. Come on, I feel like I have to say that with some kind of accent. I wonder what sort of tale we've fallen into. It's a really good, really good question, right? I wonder what sort of tale we've, we, we've fallen into. Isn't that the question that, that we wrestle with? Like, what is the purpose of my life? All that I've been through, right? The circumstances, the ups and the downs and the brokenness and the, and the things that have come to pass that I hope would come to pass and the, and the disappointments. Like, what does it matter in the grand scheme of things? Like, we spend much of our lives trying to figure out kind of the meaning and the purpose of it all, either subconsciously or, or, or consciously. We're, we're trying to make sense of of our stories. Come on, you ever have questions like, God, why? Why did you allow that to happen? Why was I born into that situation? Why, why did that unfold? We, 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 we want to know what it means. And I think one of the mistakes that we make when it comes to purpose, there's, there's two sides to it that we're going to talk about today, is that we often, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, we often tend to think about our story um, as, as separated from God's overall, arch, overall arching story, this overarching story of what he's doing in this world. I think sometimes we don't think about that. How does, how does my story find meaning in what God is doing in, in this world? I think we, we, we need to think about that. We need to learn to situate ourselves in the story of what God is doing. The other thing we don't tend to think about when we think about our purpose, we tend to make that very individual. 
There are my individual aspirations, my individual things I want to accomplish, my career goals, my financial goals. We have all these individual aspirations that we miss the truth of Scripture, and that is that we find purpose in community. We, we don't tend to think about the people that we need in our lives to help us find our purpose. Come on, there are people who point you to your purpose. And so here's the big idea that I want to put out there today. Together, we find purpose when we discover our story as part of God's redemptive story. Together, we find purpose when we find ourselves in this story, when we, when we discover our story, uh, what's going on in our lives and all the circumstances surrounding our lives as part of God's overarching redemptive story of what he's doing in this world. Come on, God is, is up to something in this world. God is moving in this world. God is working in this world, and we're invited to be a part of it. If you're looking for some meaning in your life, if there's been kind of a sense of drift and kind of a sense of purposelessness lately, let me help you today. One of the places you want to look is, God, what are you doing in this world? I want to be a part of that. That's a great place to start. I need your help today. How many of you know that's a great place to start to find some purpose? And so that's what we want to talk about today. All right, this brings me to our text, Acts chapter 2. Um, and Acts is really the story of, of the church and how it began. So the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, they are the accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. And then after that, we get to the book of Acts, which is all narrative. It's, it's the story of the church and how it got started, how it began. It, it, we might call it our origin story. It's your origin story. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is kind of your, your family history, your spiritual family history. History. And so let me just set this up for you, okay? So Jesus spent three years uh, doing ministry with the disciples, with the apostles, pouring his life into them and, and teaching them. And, and we know that Jesus was uh, arrested and crucified, and then he was resurrected. And then before he ascended back to the Father, he told the disciples, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to gather and pray and prepare. I'm leaving, but I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. I'm not leaving you by yourself. I'm not leaving you alone. And so Jesus ascends to the Father, and there's kind of this sense of what's going to happen next in the story. Sometimes we're so familiar with it that, that we miss a little bit of, of the tension. Like there's this sense of what could possibly happen next. And then we keep going to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Some of you know the day of Pentecost if you grew up in a more traditional liturgical church. In fact, we, we celebrate Pentecost around here. On the day of Pentecost, the, the, the early believers were all gathered together. The apostles and the very first disciples, they were gathered together in Jerusalem for this Jewish feast of Pentecost when the promised Holy Spirit is poured out. The Holy Spirit is poured out in the apostle Peter, who up until this time has kind of been a screw up. He messes up all the time. He's always saying the wrong thing. He's, you know, he's, he's doubting all the time and he's, he, uh, he betrays Jesus, right? The apostle Peter, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He gets up, he preaches his first sermon and 3,000 people place their faith in Jesus and get baptized. Come on, how many of you know, that's pretty good for a first sermon. My first sermon did not go over quite so well. He gets up and he preaches 3,000 people come to faith, and the church is born, and the story is unfolding. And so we get to Acts chapter 2, and we read this beautiful description of the early church. As we read this together, I want you to notice how many times the writer of Acts, which is Luke, how many times Luke says the word together as he's describing the early church, the early believers. So let's read this together. Acts chapter 2. When I, when I get to the word together, I want you just to say together out loud with me. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 47. It says they, meaning the very first Christians, the very first believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All of the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What a beautiful description 
of the early church, of the very first believers. Remember, we're, we're reading this in the context of this unfolding story that's happening through all of the biblical narrative. And, and God was showing us in Acts chapter 2, like, this is what I've had in mind all along. This is what, this is what the church is meant to look like. This is what th this community of believers, this redeemed humanity, this new humanity is supposed to look like. This, this new people filled with my spirit and, and, and the embodiment of my purposes in this world. This is what it's meant to look like. And we see this beautiful description of community, and it's called the church. The church. Now, the word church literally comes from a, a Greek word, ecclesia. If you're a Spanish speaker, you know the word ecclesia, right? Kind of similar word there. You can see where those words have some common heritage. Ecclesia means the, the called out ones. Literally, this, this new people that God is making in this world, the church. And so this is where the story continues. This is the chapter we're still on in the grand scheme of what God is doing in this world. Come on, what God is doing in this world, he's doing through his church. So if you want to be a part of what God is doing in this world, you've got to be plugged into the church, into the local body of Christ. You want to find purpose? You want to locate your, your story and the meaning of it, the significance of it? You've you got to get plugged into what God is doing in this world. And what he's doing in this world, he's doing through a family of believers, through the people of God, and it's called the church of Jesus Christ. Got to be a part of that. 2,000 years ago seems like a long time, but this is the chapter we're still on. This is what we're a part of. So I want to give you three principles of togetherness that we learn from the story of the early church. And, and these are going to be some themes that we come back. This is the roadmap for what we're going to talk about the next few weeks in, in this series. Three principles of togetherness that we, that we observe and we learn from the early church. Here's the first one. Number one, together we gather in worship to become God's people. Together we gather in worship to become God's people. I want you to think about that. Look at verse 42. Here's what it says. They devoted themselves. They were devoted, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, this is a description of worship, isn't it? What, what did they do? They, there was teaching. There was communion. They were breaking bread. There was prayer. Like, this is a description of worship. The early church was a worshiping community. They were a worshiping community. As they gathered together in worship, something happened. They got formed. They got transformed. They, they, it began to shape them, and they became the church. I want you to get this. Worship wasn't just an activity. The early believers got together, and as they worshiped, worship created something. Worship gave birth to the church. The church was birthed out of worship. This, this is so powerful. We have to realize this, that, that worship is powerful. Look at verse 43. It says, everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Like There was this amazing sense of, of God's presence and that God was moving and working in their midst and people were getting healed and, and set free and lives were being changed and they could never be the same. I want you to understand this church. Something happens when we gather together in worship. Something happens. It changes us. We don't, we don't just come in here. It's not just something we do. It's not just a routine. It's not just I go to church to sing a few songs and hear a message. We sang before, right? Break up the ground of all, all my tradition. Tear down the walls of all my religion. It's easy to sing that, but here's the reality. Sometimes we need to do that. God, I'm inviting you to kind of break me out of my little stale religious routine, and I'm inviting your presence to come here and change me. How many of you have had moments like that where you've been changed in worship? Like you came in and you experienced the healing touch of God in your heart. You experienced your mind being renewed. You experienced the grace and the forgiveness of God. Like as you worship, you begin to become aware of how out of sync you were. And God did a work in your life. And you walked out of here different than when you came in. That's the presence of God. We're formed. We're shaped. There's something that happens when we gather together and worship. One theologian put it this way. He said, I come to church to tune my instrument. I love that. I come to church to tune my instrument. It's kind of this picture of like the orchestra, right? And as, as I worship, as I hear the teaching of God's word, as I share in communion, I begin to subtly recognize the places in my life that are out of tune. And through the help of the Holy Spirit, I tune my instrument. But how many of you know you can only do that if you're part of the choir, if you're part of the, part of the orchestra, right? Like you can only do that in fellowship, in, in, in community. And so here's the idea. We don't just come to church to receive something. We come to church to become something. So many times we think about, I come to church, <laughs> I need that pick-me-up, I need that inspiration, I need that word, and yeah, I get that, that's true. But I don't just come to church to receive something, I come to become something. We're going to talk about that some more next week. Here's the second thing, we're talking about some things that we learn, some principles of togetherness. 
as we look at the early church, as we look at what God is doing in this world through the church. Number two is this, together we become spiritual family. We become spiritual family. Look at this description of verses 44 through 46. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They became a spiritual family. As they gathered together, God was moving in their midst and they became a family. They took care of each other. <laughs> they, they met practical needs. I mean, they were literally selling possessions to raise money to help each other out. And this isn't prescriptive for the church in all places. This is descriptive of a very particular time in the life of the church when it was very small. But there are some things here that we need to grab a hold of, some principles that we, did, we need to grab a hold of here when it comes to, to togetherness. They met in the temple courts daily. They were, they were committed to this. They ate meals together in each other's house. Come on, they were doing life group together. That's what they were doing. They were in fellowship with each other. And we live in a world with so much relational brokenness, so much disconnection. The number one thing that we need is a spiritual family. The number one thing that you need is a spiritual family, a place to be known, loved, and challenged. Let me describe it to you that way. You, you need a place to be known, right? To be known for who you are, not just to be loved, but to be loved for who you are, for someone to, to, to know your name. I'm thinking of that old show back in the day, Cheers, right? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Some of y'all are more of my generation. You know that song, right? <laughs> now, it was a bar, not always a good scene, not always the best place to go, but... But you want, like, you want to be known. You want to be loved and accepted for who, for who you are. Known and then loved. And then the other thing is challenged. Come on, we need to be challenged to grow. It's not enough for me to know and love my kids. I got to challenge them to grow into their potential, to grow into who God is calling them to be. That's what we need. We need to belong to a spiritual family, a spiritual family. You know, our, our church family here is, is our family in Westchester. Amy and I, we moved away from her family uh, after six years of being up in Buffalo, and my family's a long ways away down, down south. And, and I will never forget the feeling we had when we, when we moved here to start the church, and we had nobody. Our friends came and helped us move and, and unpack our moving truck. And, and man, as they were leaving and pulling out the driveway, I was kind of like the puppy dog in the window, like, could you guys please stay, right? Because there was this sense of like, really, we, we started here. We, besides a few pastor friends that I had in the area, like we, we had no one. And I'll never forget that feeling of, of feeling so so lonely. And then I think about that, I compare what it was like moving here to a few years later after we got the church open and it started growing and we started having friendships again and we started having spiritual family. Then I remember moving into our house uh, four years ago, which was a totally different experience. Our church family came around us and helped us move and, and people brought us food, right? Because we were, we were working hard. We were renovating our house and painting and people were like, hey, we don't want Pastor Jeremy and Amy to lose their mind because they still have to pastor the church. And so people came over and helped us move and, and brought us food. And my good buddy, John Sarah's over here. He's a contractor. He came and helped do some work at my house. And, and like, it was just a sense of spiritual family. Like just the church family showed up and it was such a different feeling of togetherness. Like I compare that to what it was like when we moved here. We had, we had nothing. Like our church family is our, is our family here. Like when we get sick, it's our church family that brings us food. When, when, when we need somebody to watch our kids, it's our church family that, that comes and washes our kids. When something breaks at my house, come on, I can preach, but I can't even barely screw in a light bulb. I'm calling John, like, John, come help me. I don't know what to do with this situation. <laughs> That's church family. Do you see it? You know, one of the things I love in our church, one of my favorite things that happens is when I go on social media, and I see people in our church get connected that I had no idea were friends. I love seeing that. Like I'm on Facebook and I'm like, oh my gosh, I had no idea those guys were hanging out. And they've become really good friends. And we've even had people meet here and get married. Come on, talk about becoming family. Like really becoming family. Come on, church is a good place to meet somebody. Holla, single people. <laughs> But you know, there's something beautiful that happens when, uh, whenever we receive communion, which is about once a month around here, we have this moment where, you know, we're kind of symbolically gathered around the table. We don't have an actual altar here in our, in our church space, but I love when we receive communion and, and I look around because how many of you know that nothing brings you together like sitting at a table and sharing a meal with people? 
Come on, I think that's half of the magic of the early church. They worship together, but there must have been some good food up in there. I'm sure I went to Israel. They got good food over there. I like Mediterranean food. It's, it's good. They got good seafood and chicken kebabs and lamb. It's really good. I think the early believers got together. Half of them were just showing up for the food. You know what I'm talking about. There's that person who joins your life group. And you're like, I'm pretty sure they're here just for the food. That's okay. God can work with that. He might create a church out of that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's what we did when we started this church. We just started getting together and eating all the time. Boom. A church happened. Praise the Lord. Where was I going with this? So th- th- you can only be, there's, there's something special that happens at a table. There's nothing like becoming a family. You know, we're going to gather around tables in a couple weeks for Thanksgiving with family and friends. And there's this beautiful moment in communion when we're receiving communion that I love to look around the room and I see all these different people, you know, different backgrounds, different stories and different ethnicities, black and white and Asian and Hispanic and Indian and people who live in the city and people who live in the suburbs and people from different socioeconomic classes who otherwise would have nothing in common, but they've found the most important thing in common, a shared relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's always a beautiful picture to me of what heaven's going to be like, gathered around the table of God, gathered around the table of God. So if you need a church family, I want to say welcome home. We put that sign out there for a reason. If you're searching for a church family, man, come on in, make yourself at home, because the number one thing we need is a spiritual family in this broken world. Here's the second thing. We're talking about uh, the third thing. We're talking about some things that we learned from the early church about togetherness. Point number three is this. Together, we're invited to participate in God's mission to redeem the world. Together, we're invited to be a part of something special, to participate in the mission of God to redeem the world. Look at verse 47, Acts 2, 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Come on, something special was happening. Like what God was doing in this group of early Christians wasn't just for them, it was for the world. Uh, it does, you don't get to the end of Acts chapter 2, and it says, in the early believers all found each other, and they were so happy that they found each other, and they held hands and made a circle and looked inward and sang kumbaya, and they all said, we're so glad that we found each other as the world was burning and going to hell. No, that is not what it says. That is not what it says. It says God was adding to their number daily those who were being saved, like God was doing something through them. What he was doing in them wasn't just for them, it was for the world. And see what that tells me? There's power in our collective witness. There's power in our collective witness. There's power in our togetherness. I love when we get out and we do a community outreach, a serve event, and people see us with all the blue shirts on. You know, I love it when we're out serving, cleaning up a community garden or picking up some trash or serving meals to people. And I get people every now and then come up to me and ask me, now, what is this all about? What are all the blue shirts? And, and you can tell they're intrigued. There's interest. Like, I wouldn't mind belonging to something like this. And we actually have people who have found their way into our church because they just put a blue shirt on and said, hey, can I help you guys today? Like, sure, we'll put a blue shirt on you. Just come join us. And they became part of our church family. See, that there's power in collective witness. They were experiencing the favor of all the people, it says, as they were serving, as they were loving. People saw their love for each other. People saw their generosity. People saw their passion for God and, and their passion to serve the poor. That's what the early Christians were doing. And, and, and it gave them favor with the people. Gave them favor. Notice it didn't say, and they were out in the, in the subways shouting at people in, in bullhorns and yelling at people. No, they were serving and loving, and it was attractive to the, and people began to come to, to, to Jesus. Come on, there's power in our collective witness. I, I love when, when somebody invites a friend to church, and I meet them after church, and they're like, oh yeah, this is so and so. And their friend tells me, yeah, this is my first time here, and I felt so welcome when I came in. And, you know, from the moment I pulled up in the parking lot, people greeted me, and I felt, I felt accepted, and, I, and sometimes I hear from people, I've been to a lot of other churches and didn't feel that, but I felt something special here, and I'm not putting other churches down. I'm celebrating what God is doing here. It's power and collective witness. It's power when you invite a friend to a life group, and they come with you, and they meet other believers, and they tell you, you know, I kind of thought you were a little bit crazy, but I've met your friends now, and they're all normal people, and they love Jesus just like you, but it makes an impact on them. See, because there's something of Jesus in you, and there's something of Jesus in me, and there's an experience that you have with Jesus that I don't have, and there's an experience that I have with Jesus that, that you don't have, and so when we get together, we get a more complete picture of who Jesus is. Come on, where two or three are gathered together in his name. There's power in our collective witness. It becomes a witness to the world. And so here's where I want to land the plane today. I want to remind you that together we find our greatest purpose when we, when we discover our story 
as part of God's much greater story, his redemptive story in this world. Listen to me for a moment. Your story matters. You came to church to hear this today. Somebody needs to hear this. Your story matters. What you've been through, the good, the bad, the ugly, the brokenness, the disappointments, the parts where you have questions about why. Listen to me. It matters to God and God can use your story. Somebody needs your story. Somebody needs what you've been through. Your story matters to God. And when you situate it within this powerful story of what God is doing in this world, he takes it and he uses it to advance his kingdom. And listen to me, you are not alone. You are not alone. God is inviting you into community, into his family, to belong to the people of God. There is a place for you in the body of Christ. You got to know it. that's, That's where you find purpose. That's where you find purpose. I don't know your story. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what hurts you have. I don't know what hangups you have. But here's one thing I know that we all have in common. Every one of us wants to live with some sense of purpose in our lives, some sense of significance, some sense of meaning. Every one of us wants to have meaningful connection, meaningful relationships. And we all want to get to the end of our lives one day and look back and and know that our lives counted. Be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Listen to me. God has given us his church. You can find all of those things in this beautiful thing called his church. We don't have to keep wandering and running around looking for that thing. So many people are walking past churches every day having no idea that the very thing they're looking for is what God has embodied in his people, in his church, in the family of God. God is inviting you and me to be a part of this beautiful, redemptive story. The people of God, and it's messy. It's not perfect. Like any family, we got some dysfunctions every now and then, okay? If you're here and you're new and you're wondering if this is the perfect family, we're not perfect. I love these people. I've been preaching them for years. They got problems too. I promise you. And I do too. But God invites us to be a part of something so special, so beautiful. And when we become part of it, we find purpose like never before. And so I want to pray for you today. Why don't you stand with me this morning? As you stand, let me ask you two questions. Come on, just stand with me and just stay locked in. We're going to pray. For those of you who are new to our church, we always kind of have a moment of reflection after the message. Two things. What if What if we could begin to emulate what we see in Acts chapter 2? Wouldn't it be beautiful? People doing life together. People breaking bread together. People worshiping together. People serving together. <laughs> God's favor upon us to reach our community, to reach our world. We could say, and God was adding to the church family daily <laughs> those who were being saved. What, what a beautiful thing that would be. So let me ask you this question to kind of put that in action. What's one step you need to take toward togetherness? What's one practical step? I want you to be praying about that this week. What's one step you need to take to prioritize togetherness? God God will show you. There's probably something all of us need to do. Maybe it's prioritizing being here on Sunday morning. Like I am going to be in the house of God with the family of God on Sunday morning. Come hell or high water, you can find me worshiping with my brothers and sisters on Sunday morning. It's going to become a priority for me. Maybe for some of you, it's signing up to do growth track. We do this growth track thing and we talk about membership and what it means to covenant and commit to a local house and put down roots. And it's time for you you to sign up for that next month and just say, I'm going to commit. I'm putting down roots and I'm going to get connected to to the family of God. Maybe it's making a new friend. Maybe it's being intentional to meet some people or joining a life group. Take that step. Go to our website. Get more information. Maybe it's calling someone in the church family that you haven't seen in a while. Somebody used to serve with. Somebody used to be in life group with just a, just a, a church family member. I, I text people all the time. Hey, just thinking about you. Just 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 missing you. you. You have no idea how that might help somebody reconnect. Just saying, hey, we miss you. This place isn't the same without you. One step that we can take toward togetherness because it's something we can only become together that we can never be on our own. Amen? Come on, let me pray for you today. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this beautiful gift of the church, this beautiful gift of togetherness that we're not in this world by ourselves, but God, by your son, Jesus, you've brought us into a family. You've brought us into a community. You've brought us into your house. And God, we thank you for that today. We thank you that we find meaning and purpose and significance in the story that you've invited us into. And Lord, today we commit in our hearts to this idea of togetherness. Come on, somebody needs to make that personal. God, I'm recommitting myself to be a part of what you're doing in this world. And I recognize what you're doing in this world. You're doing through your church. So I'm putting down roots. I'm committing my heart. I'm committing committing my time, my talent, my treasure, like whatever you, however you want to use me to be a part of what you're doing in this world. Thank you for it, God. And Lord, I pray for the person who 
even as I'm praying this morning, they, they feel far away from you. Maybe they feel so disconnected from you and from the church, and they're wondering if they can even be loved and accepted. But something in their heart would say today, God, I want to know you that way. As, I, as we're praying today, if that's you, we believe that is God leading you to himself. That is, the, that is the gentle tug of a loving God who is leading you to himself by his spirit, to his son, Jesus. And it starts with simply placing your faith in Jesus. It starts with saying yes to Jesus. And today can be your day to say, Jesus, I give you my yes. If that's you, just pray that prayer with me under your breath for the first time, for the hundredth time. Jesus, I'm giving you my yes today. Jesus, I say yes to you. I place my faith in you. Just pray that with me. I believe you are who you said you are, the son of God. I believe that you lived for me a perfect life on my behalf. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were resurrected to give me new life. And I place my faith in you. I turn from my sins. Pray that with me. I turn from my sins and I place my faith in you. I invite you to be my Lord and Savior. Father, I thank you for every person who prayed that prayer. I thank you for new life. I thank you for sons and daughters born again, never the same. Welcomed to the family of God. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Come on, would you put your hands together? Give God some praise in this place.